Tourism Committee. And uh, it is Wednesday the 16th of January. And uh, if I could ask you, Ms. Kim, to check to see if anyone's outside uh, so that they know we're starting the committee so they don't miss anything at this time. This is room 460, right? 1060. 1060? All right, we got it right there. So we're going to start the committee right now. Thank you very much. Trade, Commerce, and Tourism Committee at, and our on-time performance is uh, almost as good as the LAX, if I could say that right there. We have here uh, several items. And let's take the first item up first, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, the mayor submits for council confirmation his appointment of Mr. Gilbert Batista to the Los Angeles Convention and Exhibition Center Authority Board of Commissioners for the term ending on January 16, 2009. This would fill the vacancy created by the mayor's removal of Mr. Barry S. Glazer on October 31, 2007. Great. And is Gilbert here? Yes, sir. I, I know. Come on up, Gilbert. How are you? Just fine, thank you. How are you doing? Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. So when's the last time you've been to the convention center before you uh, got this uh, call? I was at an exhibition for a soccer uh, convention a couple uh -huh. years ago. Oh, well, good. And then right before the holidays, I was invited to go back uh -huh. and tour the new facility and the upgrades. Good, good. So you're looking excited about this post? Yes, I am, sir. Good. Okay. And you've been briefed by staff a little on all the process? And oh, indefinitely. Uh -huh. I, I spent a couple hours there. They had a nice yeah. uh, um, PowerPoint presentation, last, asked a lot of questions right. about the future. They laid it all out, and it looks mm -hmm. very promising. Extremely promising. And then the connectivity to the LA Live and Staples and all of what goes on there. All of those. And the leadership that LA Inc. provides to help and sell Los Angeles. So uh, we're going to recommend approval, okay? That's fine with me, sir. All right, Gilbert. And you can go back to the uh, your very important role with the County of Los Angeles right now. That's a very important role that you have. I, I appreciate it. Nice Thank to see you. Thank you for your service to the county and what you do. And uh, we'll see you in full council. When is this scheduled? Today. Shay, go have some coffee. I will do that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty. Thank you. All right. Now, let's just see here. On uh, number two, it's a harbor ma matter. I'm going to hold that for Ms. Hahn to arrive momentarily. Okay, number three is additionally a harbor. If you want to order, Mr. LeBron. Okay. Bob was asked for item six to be continued. All right, let's ask uh, anyone here from uh, airport department, item number six. Okay, they asked it to be continued, correct? Could you put that for the record? Yeah, that's correct. We uh, wanted it to be continued so our executive director could be here. Good, okay. Great. Okay, so let's continue item six on February 6th. Okay, good. All right, thank you. That's great. How do you do it in the fog today? You know? Very carefully. I know. It's amazing to watch the fog bank. This morning when I was hiking in Griffith Park, the fog bank was well south of Baldwin Hills, and then it just started creeping across the city. And then uh, we live in Silver Lake, and there's hills in Silver Lake, and it just came in. And, in fact, there was, all of a sudden there's all these fire trucks coming. I called the captain about a half hour later at 56 as he told me the fog sometimes creates a dynamic where people think it's smoke. And it was just unbelievable uh, how it is. So the first thing I thought about you guys out at LAX is how you bring those planes safely down. And uh, it's amazing. Because you, how often do you have to close because of fog? Shut down. Um, I don't believe we ever shut down for the fog. We changed the operational procedures yeah. occasionally because of the fog. But 40, 50 years ago, with technology not being able to was, you had to shut down and stop sure. in other places for that. Sure. So. Okay, well, item number six, then we're going to continue it to the sixth, if we could here. And is there any public comment today? Any public comment? You, we have a, your card and ID on hand if you want to do public comment right now. Okay. So let's just talk on number five. Is that correct there? Yeah, five. I think we're going to go consent on number five, okay? This is the uh, contract on number five for curbside. Anyone here on number five? I'm here on number five. You're here on five, and she's here on number one, two, three, four, five, and six, and seven, and eight. Please welcome Janice Hahn. Thank you very much. 
Ms. Han, if the clerk could give uh, Ms. Han a little briefing on what we tried to do to get us further down the line Good. this morning. <laughs> what have you done? The clerk is going to tell you so they're more official. Um, you actually inter uh, interviewed Mr. Bautista for commissioner to the Convention and Exhibition Center Authority. I'm going to approve that Senate to Council for this morning. So our commissioner has been approved. I okay. think you'll enjoy oh, good, his good. dedication. Um, good. Do you, do you need to take a vote on that to have two members? Sure, if you'd sure like. why don't we? Mm -hmm. We'll re-vote it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Moved. Approved. Okay. And now would you like to go to number two, Mr. Well, no, we want to do yes. number six. We continue. Is that correct? To February 6th. I did that on the right. request of and the... We, uh, were were there any reports? consents? Five, Five was consent. consent. Okay, good. So we're right, we're right in line. Very good. Okay, let's go to two. Thank you. Under item two, the Board of Harbor Commissioners submits for approval amendment number one to the personal services agreement with Norman H. Emerson doing business as Emerson and Associates for professional funding development services for the Harbor Department's integrated transportation and infrastructure funding program. The CAO also has submitted a report and a recommendation for approval of this contract amendment. Good morning, Council Good morning, members. Good morning, Jenny. I'm Jenny Chavez with the Port of Los Angeles. I'm here to answer any questions regarding this extension of an agreement for transportation funding consulting services. Great. Well, I know, obviously, Norm Emerson through my work at ACTA. Um, so basically, we're extending his contract for three years. Yes, three years. To the tune of $600,000. What do we expect, or what do you expect to get from that? Um, well, Mr. Emerson has um, a, a lengthy uh, resume and expertise and has been in the process of helping us obtain funding um, under the Proposition 1B. Um, as you know, you've uh, helped us, been a leader in advocating for our fair share of funding, and um, Mr. Emerson is helping us in the application process um, and in advocating for us to get that funding. And also, in the coming year, we will be entering the federal reauthorization process, so we're trying to get our fair share from Congress um, f to pay for critical goods movement infrastructure projects. How much is that going to be worth, do we think? Um, at the federal level, we'll, we shall see. Uh, the uh, 1909 Commission just came out with some recommend interesting recommendations yesterday in terms of a new <laughs> national revenue stream for goods movement projects. So that would be an incredible opportunity and something that I know you've been asking for for a long time. So True. we hope to maximize. And are we in a better spot now that we've decided to enact our own um, infrastructure container fee? Absolutely. I mean, we, we are in a in an incredible position now because we have we're putting forward our local share and we're saying you know we're asking industry you need to put in your local share and that's how we can best leverage state money and federal money so there's really no reason for the state or federal government to shortchange us on this end since we're putting that money forward and it will help us match whatever's available so what do we have we prior what what have we prioritized the projects that we want to really put at the top tier for funding what how would you prioritize them um, right now we have for the for the fee that we just approved or just for you know like three years from now you know what what top projects will we have hoped to will fund? be funded well um, in the poor areas there are some critical infrastructure projects as you know there are some uh, some highway projects you know just to assist in the uh, movement of truck traffic off and on the 110 freeway to um, help facilitate you know that so that there's less congestion on Harbor Boulevard and less congestion into the community area so it's easier for trucks to get from the terminals to the freeways to right. increase the, the the rail projects and improve on dock so that's really critical um, and that needs to be improved because a lot of the infrastructure now even though it's the, the infrastructure that's off the terminal but um, isn't uh, but is on the port property we need to take care of because that's 
we're, we still need to connect the on dock to where it's eventually going. So those projects are critical. Um, we're also looking at regional projects. You know, it's not just defined to what's in the port area. I mean, this is a regional system of goods movement. It's all of Southern California. So we're looking at projects out in the Inland Empire as well. So, we'll and I would think he, I would think his work with ACTA as well as the port will help on projects like SR forty seven. I mean, that's Absolutely. obviously mutually beneficial not only to the region but to Absolutely, SR forty seven and um, the Desmond Bridge are the top two projects right now for the region, and they've been identified not only by the ports but by the state and the federal government as critical goods movement projects. So. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, all of our goals have been to improve the infrastructure to, um, to really n not even prepare for the growth. I mean, that's one of them, but catch up kind of with the growth that's happened um, at the port. And I think our infrastructure is way behind um, just catching up with the ability to move the goods efficiently. Um, <laughs> but it's also, I think, these infrastructure projects are key to one of my goals, which is naturally... Um, you know, getting these trucks um, out of residential neighborhoods in Wilmington. I mean, it just hasn't been a good in and out uh, into the port terminals, and they've been doing shortcuts. And and I also think, I also think, you know, everybody gets nervous about container fees, and everybody gets nervous about environmental restrictions. But I still say that landside congestion mm -hmm. is will would be the number one reason that we lose business. Um, at, at the ports these you know people want their goods delivered on time on budget and we've got to figure out how to get rid of the land side congestion and these these projects would help to do that so um, hopefully norm will be able to not only identify funding but be able to move move it forward to actually so we can receive the funding we still you know are like 85 percent of the goods movement in California mm -hmm. it comes in and out of ports of Long Beach and Los Angeles we've never in my opinion gotten our not even our fair share we need more than our fair share I mean we move the goods for California and the country we are America's port mm -hmm. Mr. Bonds. just a question I know Mr. Emerson is very good does the city of Long Beach and the airport have the same type of person no, not even close. Ooh. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, you know, we work very closely with the Port of Long Beach um, on all these projects. These are joint priority projects for the Port of Long Beach in mm. L.A. I mean, we are neighbors without borders. Without well, how does Long Beach do it without somebody like Norm Emerson? That's the question. Well, we help them. I understand that. But, I mean, in all seriousness, I mean, I, I want to know what both ports commit. Because it's, uh, both ports are very intense and successful because the region had built that way. But I want to make sure Long Beach is... You know, not just drafting off us. Sometimes, right. you know, you and do all the work. We have consultants on, on on board as well. But there's some coordination on that as well. And also, I wanted to make sure is the Port of Los Angeles brief uh, Dana Rohrbacher and any congressional member who has an interest in this. Yes, um, we work with his staff regularly. Um, they, they know about this. About the this consulting. Yeah. Um, Why don't you tell them? Say, look, we're committed. Keep them informed. Just keep telling them about what you're doing because you do a lot. And I also think why we don't get our fair share is we don't tell the people enough about what we do. I'm going to support this because Ms. Hahn's going to support it. I thank you for your comments and uh, tell you. Thank you. And I would like, you know, I would like to have some kind of, um, let's just figure out some kind of a regular update um, because we also need to be told about where we're at what lobbying we need to do from the city of Los Angeles up in Sacramento and in, in Washington DC to help us achieve these funds I think the time is now uh, it's all coming to a head in terms of uh, the growth at the port and our aging infrastructure so keep us regularly I don't know how we want to define that uh, updated on how norms doing and how, how we're all doing uh, to uh, achieve this goal yeah, Alvin Newman, CAO's office. One of the components of this contract and amendments uh, are the uh, cooperation of task force meetings, and the task force meetings include port management. It also includes uh, representatives from the legislative branch of the city, uh, the CLA, the CAO, uh, the mayor's office, and working with our representatives in Sacramento and Washington, D.C. Uh, a primary component of this program was to work with the community, public and private agencies in order to get ideas and 
and to develop an implementation, implementation plan uh, for this funding plan that Emerson is involved in. So we could have regular updates from this task force. There's, a t there's a, actually a working task force? Um, yes, it's an, an internal task force right now. Um, but, you know, any format that you would like, if you'd like okay. us to give you written briefings or okay. updates. <coughs> okay. How often does this group meet? Um, fairly regularly. Um, we produce reports so that we can forward those if you'd like. Okay. I, I would certainly like to get copies of those reports. Okay. Would you like to move? Move. I'll move it. Move. Okay. And approved. Okay. Thank you, Jenny. Under item three, the Board of Harbor Commissioners submits for approval amendment number two for to what, what item? An, an agreement with Parsons Water and Infrastructure Incorporated. Originally, this contract was for construction management services for berths 100 to 147 improvements. Um, the, the scope has changed somewhat over time. Um, the amendment would extend the current term by one year so that the total term now would be seven years expiring on October 11th, 2008. The CAO also has submitted a report and a recommendation for approval of the amendment. Good morning. Hi. I'm uh, Sean Shavistani. I'm the Chief Engineer of the Construction Division at the Port, and we're here to ask for an extension of uh, Parsons' contract. Uh, Parson was brought in to uh, provide construction management and uh, initially planned for several projects. China Shipping Phase 1, Berth 100 was one of them, and several uh, channel crossings that were successfully completed uh, uh, to support our main channel deepening project. Uh, and we brought in this contract for an extension three years ago um, um, for um, uh, because of the delay, as, as, as everyone knows, on the EIRs uh, uh, on some of the projects, and they've been providing uh, valuable uh, constructability uh, reviews and design reviews to make sure when we do get to construction that we will have uh, minimized uh, change orders um, and, and issues during construction. They're also providing a, a web-based uh, construction management uh, for us, and we've been working with them, and that uh, task is going to be uh, completed uh, by the time the, this extension will be over and which will help us do a more efficient and effective um, uh, means of communicating during construction with our designers and, and contractors. And, 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 and since the other projects have been delayed, uh, Parsons also helped us in finishing the Charter School, the 250 5th Street, and also they're currently uh, providing a valuable uh, construction management role in the waterway, uh, waterfront gateway project. So right. uh, any questions that you may have, I'll be right. more than happy to answer. Um, one of the uh, things they've done is provided services for the TRAPAC EIR process. Can you tell me kind of what they've, how they've been involved in that? Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely, yeah. The, their, their involvement has been um, uh, looking at the emissions, uh, mm -hmm. construction emissions, and uh, looking into regulatory requirements mm -hmm. and providing information through uh, expertise, actually mm -hmm. sub-consultant uh, through uh, Parsons, um, how we can reduce emissions during construction. And, and with that, we've been able to uh, uh, work with our environmental management division to set requirements that exceeds any, any regulatory agency. We're, we're going to be tier two and above. On our, uh, when we do get to construction, so that's that's one. Is that, is that equipment? Equipment. Is that is that the is that our is that the best equipment available right now? Is that the cleanest tier? What, tier, tier two, is and, the, and then is the best available construction equipment right now. That's correct. That's correct. And, and that's and in the is that, that's specified in the EIR. That's specified in the EIR, and ultimately we'll get into the contract documents that uh, we'll be asking con uh, contractors to comply with. The other thing they've been doing on that particular project is, as I said, constructability review, design review, to make sure that when we do get to construction, we will not bring a lot of change orders to the board for, uh, for modifications. Right. Why, why are they saying that the emissions are going to actually increase mm -hmm. at TRAPAC during the first five years during construction? And well, well, 
obviously, if there's going to be construction, there's going to be some increases, but we're going to minimize that, uh, that uh, emissions that's going to come through the uh, construction by making sure that the contractor provides the best available technology uh, and equipment that's available out there. Well, um, not just for this project, for yeah, all the for projects, all projects. that are going to come up. Has uh, has Parsons ever suggested that the port have a uh, a port wide policy on every construction project that the equipment should be uh, the cleanest available technology? That's because uh, you know, obviously, if we get through this EIR, we've got like seventeen. Waiting, waiting. But I've never seen uh, a policy at the Harbor Department that would be no matter what um, they use the cleanest available uh, construction equipment. Has Parson recommended that to Par the Harbor Department? Or? We actually internally are um, are looking at that, and and we we had a discussion with Mr. Christensen yesterday on this okay. particular issue, uh, and and we'll be working at that. But but the trade pack EIR is going to set the minimum the way we look at it. Okay. And from here, we're going to be looking at to see because air quality is 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 important for all of us, and we need to. Well, do yeah, and it's more than important. It's 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 essential. Essential. It's essential, um, and it's clear the the port, and I know the mayor believes this, uh, you know, it's just not going to be able to uh, grow unless, you know, we we can really um, show that we're reducing emissions, and we, we just, we have to do a better job of that. Um, speaking of TREPAC, I, I see this, ex this uh, extension is only for a year for Parsons. Uh, now, as you know, the TREPAC EIR has been appealed, uh, so obviously construction is not going to be starting in the next couple of weeks, That's correct. Uh, are, are they going to be working on other projects? What else? What else would they be working on? Yeah, Parsons currently, as I said, is working on the completing the waterfront. And right. The, the water feature. Have they always been the the uh, engineering firm overseeing the water feature? And that's not correct. We uh, we brought them in because these pro other projects delayed, so we brought them in to help us on that. Uh, but they're also working on this web Because the water feature has been incredibly delayed. The water feature was supposed to be built May of 2005. And uh, I, I understand that it <laughs> got delayed uh, when, um, I can tell you that when we started construction, we are, we are tracking pretty much on schedule. Uh, when we, uh, as soon as we got advertised, we we're on top of it, and maybe Steve can say a few words, because I know day in and out, he's, is working on that project really hard. That fountain was supposed to be completed when Disney brought their ships for the summer of 2005. Right. Yeah, we were brought in in April to take over the construction management uh, of this, and um, yeah, it's a it's technically it's a very challenging job. It looks like a it looks like a pond in a in a fountain, but uh, uh, technically challenging, and uh, you're going to end up with a, a real world class feature there at the entrance to the cruise terminal when it's uh, finished the middle of this year. So you're projecting it'll be finished in June? five months. The middle June? of this year. I was saying the middle yeah. of this year is five. June. Or our yes. Well, the, July really. We're talking well, about June mid thirtieth. Okay. <laughs> mid June. July first. We, we expect that to see a lot of folks on Fourth of July being right next there and to the. Yeah. Monster. Okay. We're going to hold you to that. Um, so. Um, in terms of the tray pack, uh, Parsons will be um, still the project manager or construction manager. Or will they actually be doing the construction work? Or? No, uh, Parsons will not be involved uh, because we anticipate by the time that this contract will be over, the one year extension, that uh, they will not be involved. They okay. are providing. So they're, but you're saying in this in the last year, they're basically going to be focusing on the water feature on the waterfront. What and else? And the web-based uh, construction management, which is a big effort uh, to make sure that we have a program in place that we can communicate between the designers and construction contractors and ourselves to ba basically make it a paperless process. Right. Uh, and um, Well, one of the things I would like to request is that part of what Parsons um, provides in this last year is a, or quickly, is a very good policy 
uh, that the park could adopt in terms of clean construction equipment uh, as we move forward. Uh, you know, how that's going to work, what, how they recommend that the port adopt a policy. If, if Parsons could really play a big role in that, I think that would go a long way towards, uh, in the future, moving these EIRs a lot um, quicker and cleaner uh, without objections um, from the community. We will absolutely do that. Okay. Just a question here. Uh, you know, uh, 30 years ago, Parsons probably did something for the port, you know, and someone would come down to the port and they'd sit and have a meeting. Do they bill you? How do they bill you? How do they bill this? I just out of curiosity. Uh, the, the way we have uh, the agreement structured is based on, based on a monthly um, a lump sum uh, and it's basically because we, we had a lump sum for project manager and the office engineer and then we had time and material as we brought in more more projects and we negotiated but uh, since the other projects have been delayed it's basically a lump sum monthly fee basically Steve and his assistant that's being billed and it's a monthly uh, mm -hmm. fee that and they're on time they come right down the freeway if you need be they're out of Pasadena aren't they yeah, we're full. We're full time yeah. on on the project. We're we have a trailer there. that trailer. Good. Okay. We, we're, we're All right. Here's the key. Make Miss Han happy, Absolutely. and I'll be happy. Okay. That's beautiful. Thank you very much, Miss Han. <laughs> That's Thank a beautiful you. thing. Thank you. Okay. Approved. Thank you. Appreciate right. that. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. But I would love to. I want to see that policy. Absolutely. Quickly. Okay. Under item four, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for approval the first amendments to say? ten on-airport automobile rental concession agreements at LAX. Uh, this first amendment would extend the initial five-year terms by two additional years expiring on January 31, 2010, and would add or revise various provisions relating to operations of the auto rental concessionaires. Um, during the two-year extension, the department expects to decide whether or not to build a consolidated rental car facility, and the CAO has submitted a report and a recommendation for approval. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Karen Tozer with Los Angeles World Airports Concession Services. I'm uh, here to answer any questions that you may have on, this, on these ten amendments. Uh, let's see. One of the things I would like to know, where are we on our, the status of the consolidated rental car facility? Um, my understanding is that um, the, uh, there, there is, of course, an architect on board. They are proceeding to uh, review all of the project definition that has taken, so, taken place so far um, and develop and, and refine that program, uh, make recommendations for a business and finance plan. Uh, have, we and have we chosen the site yet? Is there oh, a, yes. There's yes. a site. Oh, yes. The site has... It was part of uh, the, the specific plan and the master plan. Okay, so, so it's still at that site. It's still at that site. Okay. But, you know, there were issues about orientation and, and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, we would anticipate that we would be able to begin some uh, negotiations and discussions with the rental car companies by the end of this year, early next, with the anticipation of, of doing a new request for bid right. uh, mid-09, which would be at the same time that we would need to, to go back to the board to extend the um, uh, customer the CFC funding for the project. Okay. So it's all, you know, basically aligned to move forward uh, on a timely basis within this two-year. So until we get our consolidated rental facility, I know we had a trip reduction program where these rental cars were supposed to be sharing shuttles. How is that going? It's actually going very, very really? well. You know, the the trip reduction program had a goal to reduce the shuttle trips in right. the central terminal area by 20 percent. Right. Um, as of now, they have actually reduced by 33 percent. Really. Over the base year. Who um, monitors that? Uh, our uh, landside operations, uh, each of the buses has transponders, so each trip is Can actually we, recorded, so we know well, nobody exactly. Stand, nobody has to stand out there and no, we don't. shuttles. <laughs> Good. Good to know. No. So um, the program actually is going very well. We're very pleased. And who shares shuttles? Uh, at this point, the co there, there are only two companies that are co-busing, and that is Alamo and National. Um, co-busing. Uh, well, no, that's not true. Uh, Payless and... Uh, Fox also co-bus. I apologize. Um, we're looking so at just with those. Two
two, four companies, we've reduced it? Oh, no, no, no. We've also imposed limits on the number of trips oh. that any oh, rental oh, car oh, company oh. can make. Oh, so you track everybody. Yes. Yes. And, and then what happens if they've made more than? There is a penalty that is assessed for any um, overage over their, their allocation. Um, and it's a two-step two penalty. Uh, if they just go slightly over, it's $5 per trip. Uh, if they go significantly over, then it's $10 per trip penalty. The first year, we did actually. So you, you track them at like at the end of the month, and then you? Yes. And then you end of the month, and then it's actually annualized at the end of the year. Um, and in the first year Earth with the falling. penalty phase, we, we did actually have to issue some penalties, regrettably. Really? But this year, it, we, it does not appear. Now, that we, we, when this first started, we heard a little grumbling by, I don't remember who, some of the companies that were felt they had to co-bus. How, how did you, how did we determine who co bust and who didn't? Are there incentives for the, facility, the yeah. car rental facilities sharing a bus? Right. We have not mandated co-busing. Okay. It is a voluntary okay. program at this time, but there are indeed incentives uh, in Do the they trip get more program. Trips? Well, it, it's, it's a, they don't get, we actually reduce the number of trips for the two companies, but they're not reduced to just one. So there's, there's some adjustments that are made. There's a form. Yeah, I know we've um, converted these shuttles to uh, clean air. Um, the existing contract, the, the current contract before the extension has a requirement that all of the buses either need to be retrofitted with diesel particulate traps or converted to um, alternative fuel vehicles. And all of the companies that are, are, have retrofitted are complete with those retrofitting and the companies that are actually ordering CNG buses, some have not been delivered as yet, but they are on order and will be And delivered. who checks that? How do, you, how do you monitor whether or not they have a diesel particulate trap? Uh, we, we'll, we require them to self-report. You self open the hood? <laughs> do we you require can. them to self-report and then we do do audits, of course. Um, and then where are we in, in moving forward of more of the actual rental cars to be uh, clean vehicles? Um, you know, at this point, we do not have mm -hmm. the ability it is recommended that we not mandate this program right. and we create some incentives. Um, what, we've, what we've found is that the rental car companies actually are, are voluntarily moving forward with more and more green fleets. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, becoming socially, uh, a, a social demand and, and so we're seeing that a lot of them have um, more than 50% of their fleets with vehicles that get 28 really? miles per gallon or than better mileage that they yeah. have. Um, they have an, uh, Hertz, for example, has an entire uh, section on their website where you can reserve a green car by type. Um, uh, Enterprise actually has, is funding a research institute to explore more alternative fuel options. So uh, we're seeing a lot of voluntary uh, efforts in this, in this manner. Um, and we do believe that going into the, to the new RFB, we will absolutely You've put some, some, some and strategic and what are you thinking? What kinds of strategic incentives? It would probably be a, f a financial offering. Yeah. Um, and again, that becomes fairly complicated because you, you know, need to make sure that the alternative fuel vehicle truly is, you know, efficient. That some alternative fuel vehicles, as you know, may not get very good mileage. And so you, you have to balance those. So we need to set some thresholds. But you're working on that. Yeah, I'm, I'd be very interested to see how that that plan works we have out. a little bit of time to Yeah, I know. Refine. But that, I think that's key. And I think we would be leading the nation uh, with that kind of plan for our, our new consolidated rental facility. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Uh, Just uh, keep up doing the job. It's amazing how industry does uh, change rapidly with the, the fuel efficient vehicles or the uh, Priuses, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's difficult sometimes. They do not like to mix their they're all in the marketing there, but uh, I think we've got to move ahead on all of this here and make sure that we're on the same line. I don't want to see people come to Los Angeles taken advantage of by anyone, you know, and make sure we're consistent with what would be in Portland, Miami, Detroit, Chicago, New York, is how they deal with rental cars. I just hope uh, that is always the case. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. We don't want to be consistent with those other airports. We want to be better. That's I understand that, but I was thinking yes. of the way of taking advantage. Sometimes people take advantage, Bill. You don't know. You come to Los Angeles. I represent Hollywood. They come to Los Angeles. Sometimes people get taken advantage of, you know, instead of being 
welcomed as well. Speaking of that, let me. Let, we have new k interactive kiosks, I guess, down in the baggage area that helps people with this rental car. How does how do those work? As part of our advertising uh, con concession, one of the requirements we had was that they um, establish, uh, install, develop, and install interactive visitor centers to replace the um, the old uh, rental car counters, the hotel motel phone boards, right. and these are very nice kiosks. They have the telephones, but it's touch screen. You yeah. you know a little little bed you touch you get a hotel you it tells you what number to press and it rings too so it, they're very um, they're very attractive they're very user friendly they're they're located in very obvious locations so that the arriving passengers are able to find them very easily and utilize uh, all of the information on them good yeah yeah uh, good, good morning. morning good morning, good morning. Uh, I'm excited to hear what you're saying let me just go over a few questions I missed sure. the beginning of Ms. Hans uh, uh, set of questions. Uh, I've noticed that if you've given the rental car companies the option of retrofitting their existing diesel fuel vehicles with particular traps instead of complying with the alternative fuel vehicle requirement. Is that true? No, no. Um, the existing contract, the contract that doesn't expire till the, till the end of this month, yeah. had a requirement that they had to, by the end of the contract, either retrofit all of their, their shuttles with diesel particulate traps or replace them with alternative Excellent. fuel vehicles. Excellent. They are all in compliance with that. The amendment now requires them to comply with the alternative vehicle alternative fuel vehicle program that was developed as part of the community benefits agreement right. and that will require that at least 50 percent of their shuttle fleet is a hundred percent alternative fuel vehicle by the by January 31st of 2010, 100% of their fleet would have to be uh, alternative fuel vehicle by 2015. Excellent, excellent. Next covers. question. So it, is, it covers both. And, and Ms. Hahn was, was moving in that direction with you on it, and we, I liked what you were saying, but let me get a little more specific. Does this contract present an opportunity to encourage rental car companies to increase the number of hybrid and alternative fuel vehicles in their rental fleets? In other words, can we set a goal that by 2010 they must have X, and by 2015 they must have Y, um, and get them to, to move in that direction? Can we do that? Um, um, at this point in time, the city attorney has advised that we should not mandate it, but that we can provide incentive programs. Uh, there are some concerns about possible legal challenges through mandating. Um, as part of this amendment, we have not put those incentive programs in place as yet because uh, we find that the rental car companies voluntarily are moving towards more green uh, and alternative fuel vehicle fleets. We do intend to put a, an incentive program in place with the, with the next contract. Um, and the reason we haven't done it as yet is that it's a very complicated program and we need to make sure that we're incentivizing for the right right vehicles. I like that and I look forward to seeing that plan because uh, that does put the energy out there for them to, to take it very seriously. You know, I think it might be interesting. I'd actually like to get maybe a report back from the city attorney on I'd their thinking yeah. on not mandating it. Because when you look at the port, uh, they have just entered into a concession model of banning uh, all dirty trucks that service the port. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering why on that end that is legal and yet we've been advised that we cannot mandate the cars uh, that uh, are rented at our airport. So I would, I would be very interested in having that. the city attorney I opine publicly on what the thinking is there. I'll be happy to pass that information okay. back and, to the city attorney. And then with that, we'd like to see the incentive plan clearly outlined. Okay, next question. When do Can you I ask a question on that question? Yeah. So we can, of course. I just think we should make a call <laughs> to the, air, air, the rentals out there right now yeah. and see, because I think the consumer is demanding it. Uh, Mr. Rosendahl, the consumer is demanding it, and the consumer will be a, a greater incentive for that, you know, and maybe we should have a little picture out there of you next to a parking meter say, if you rent, I'm Councilman Bill Rosendahl, if you rent a uh, energy efficient car, you don't have to pay at the meter in like Los Angeles. We'll get rid of the picture of the mayor as you come in. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. okay. I, I, I might speak yeah. to that just right. for a just moment. If you could, this is important. That, that, that both picture. Yeah, right. Rental car companies have told us actually they would have more 
green vehicles in their fleet if they could actually get them. Right. You know, the, the supply is, is a limitation Detroit. as well. So they're, but they are moving But I look, look forward to a report back that gives us some sense of strategies and so forth. Great so idea. Okay. okay. When Great do you idea. expect to select the firms that will design and plan the CONRAC? Um, that, doesn't, that doesn't fall under my juris jurisdiction, but that has been done. There, there is a, 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 there has been an RFP process and, a, and a, an architectural firm has been solicited and they are, um, I believe they've, I, if they haven't actually started work, they are working on the first, the, the scope okay. of the first. Can we get a report back on that and a status update from whoever's in charge of that? Sure. Uh, Councilman Mark Adams, Hello. Los Angeles World Airports. I can probably just answer that question right now. The, um, we're in negotiation with the architectural firm that has been selected and we should be awarding the contract. I think the schedule is to do that in March at this, of this year is what we're hoping to do. Okay, um, if you could share with us uh, some substance on that in the next committee meeting, we'd like to see that, just to get an update on it. Um, have you con given consideration to moving the proposed location of the Conrack to Manchester Square, where there is immediate access to the 405? I believe that that is something that the architectural firm will be instructed to look idea. at, although the, the, the other area is already part of the specific plan master plan. Uh, that was my understanding that they were going to look at possible alternative sites. Okay, we want to see that because it would be an exciting move if we moved it toward that location. And the last question is, does this contract present an opportunity to encourage rental car companies to increase the number of hybrid and alternative fuel vehicles in the rental fleet? In other words, will the contract give any incentive? To, that's what you said before what they would. Said, yeah. So we'll see that in the report back. It, 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 it's not in this contract, but we certainly intend to put it in the next bid, yes. Great, great. Thank you, Sure. Good, good. Karen, thank you for that wonderful report. We do have uh, one comment on item four. Arnold Sachs, come on down. Good morning, Arnold Sachs. Thank good you. Um, <clears throat> just a few questions. <clears throat> the uh, person giving the report mentioned tracking of the vans. Is there a, any kind of discrepancy? Because I know that when you talked about track the, the taxi cabs there was a discrepancy between the number of taxi cabs and the amount of money being generated from the trips that the cab companies were complaining that the airport as an audit was done last year and we never really uh, followed, had any kind of follow up on that but I'm just wondering if, if there was any kind of discrepancies between the tracking of the rental vans and and the numbers that come back from the airport um, are they permitted by the by the city uh, I went to the airport commission meeting and I noticed a lot of shuttle vans picking up downstairs without city permits and I was wondering why that occurs along with that I noticed the shuttle dispatchers had no permits either like the um, taxi cab shuttle dispatchers they have a permit on their jacket from the city um, and back to the shuttle vans, could that, the, the rental car uh, structure that's going to be proposed or posed, could that include space for people who use shuttle vans in, instead of having the individual vans go around the airport picking up people, could they be directed to one location where the shuttle vans could pick them up there? Um, that's the point of the consolidated rental facility. Well, that's the rental car. I, I just thought that was for rental cars, not just for, I'm talking about shuttle vans, people taking like, oh, like super, super shuttle, shuttle or prime time oh. shuttle, where they could also be incorporated into going off terminal, off airport property per se, or the airport central location, mm -hmm. and moving to a place where the mm -hmm. individual prime time other mm -hmm. shuttle van mm -hmm. could be allowed to pick their passengers up without it would eliminate trips <clears throat> and I also don't believe that the, the, the prime time shuttle van services quote unquote are charged like cabs and I don't believe they're charged per trip either and I that's discrepant that's the uh, that's a discrepancy that should be corrected <clears throat> and also you mentioned that the structure is going to be awarded a contract or contracts going to be awarded for the structure whichever way this will be a green structure. I don't want to hope to have a situation like we had with the new terminal where they had to come back and say, well, we have to add $10 million to the cost of the structure because mm -hmm. nobody said it was going to be green. 
and that's a lot of money to spend on toilet bowls and uh, right. Bowls. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold. Mm. Okay. Uh, having heard all of the reports on the yes. Um, will the rental car structures be incorporating any kind of a people mover? That's part of the <coughs> updated plan for the LAX. Thank, thank, you, thank you. Thank you for your keen observations. Um, okay. Having heard comments and reports. I'm, I will move forward on. Okay. That. Second. Second. Okay. Approve. Okay, we oh, took five on consent. We six. You continued six. We continued six, so we're to seven. So five, I also agree on consent. Okay. <laughs> Under item seven, the Board of Airport Commissioners submits for <coughs> approval a 40-year lease with Aero Ontario RFP LLC for occupation of a cargo site and development of an international air cargo center at Ontario International Airport. The CAO also has submitted a report and a recommendation for approval of this long-term <coughs> lease. Good morning. Good morning. Ramon Olivares with Economic Development at LA World Airports. It's really great to be here today. This project has got a long history. You may have heard about it over the last few years. It does have a long history. Yes, it has a long history. But we're re very, very uh, happy at, uh, at where we are today, and that we're, we're glad to be here to report to you on the, on the project. This project, uh, uh, the item before you concerns the, our recommendation to award a, a long-term ground lease to Aero Ontario for the development of a cargo center at, uh, at Ontario Airport. Um, this project is really more, and this item is really more, uh, uh, it, more about, it, it's about more than just a lease. It's about regionalizing uh, air traffic within the region in the greater LA area and specifically uh, regionalizing air, um, air traffic with respect to cargo traffic. Um, SCAG projections in our own long-term planners at, at LAWA project that uh, cargo growth in the region will go from about 3 million, uh, million annual tons of, of cargo within the region to about 9 million by 2030. We need to be ready for that. <coughs> LAX can only accommodate, uh, we believe, somewhere around 3 million uh, annual tons of cargo. Uh, last year, LAX was at about two million, 2 million. Ontario Airport, on the other hand, has been at about uh, half a million for the last couple of years. We believe that Ontario is uh, ideally uh, situated to handle that cargo growth. Uh, there are other, of course, other uh, airports in the region that can accommodate some of that traffic, but none are, uh, have the characteristics uh, ideally suited uh, to cargo like, uh, like Ontario Airport. Um, as I mentioned a moment ago, the project does have a long history. Uh, we did go through a... Uh, I mean, why has it taken so long? I mean, the first RFP was released in 2001. Arrow term was selected in 2003. It's now 2008. Right, right, right. Yeah, we, uh, we anticipated that question, and it's a question that is often asked, believe me. Uh, I've been on this project, actually, for pretty much the entire length of that project. Um, it's a complicated project. Uh, it does involve, uh, the project, by the way, for those of you that aren't familiar, is located on approximately 94 acres on the northwest quadrant of Ontario Airport. Um, the project is very complicated. Um, uh, uh, Aero Ontario was required to go through a full EIR uh, study and analysis. Uh, the, um, the, um, they were also required to do a full NEPA review and analysis for the project. Uh, pursuant to federal requirements. Um, there was a lot of uh, coordination uh, required, not, not only in-house, but, uh, but uh, externally with uh, other folks impacted by the project, particularly with respect to uh, the folks at the City of Ontario. Uh, uh, there was a lot of coordination that needed to occur with respect to the development of our own uh, master plan for Ontario Airport and wanting to make sure that the projections uh, that Aeroterm's own consultants were uh, preparing uh, for their project with respect to projections and so forth at Ontario were consistent with that, those master plan issues. So needless to say, there, was, there were just a lot of, a lot of issues uh, involved. Not to mention, and I should, I should mention, uh, which uh, obviously uh, you are already aware about, uh, is uh, there, had been a, there has been a lot of change at, uh, at LAWA. And uh, we've gone through a, a couple of different executive directors, uh, managers at the top level have changed. You know, that has tended to slow down uh, couple mayors. progress. A couple mayors. couple mayors, mayors. Cor correct. Uh, it's, it has tended to slow the project down a little bit, but needless to say, it's, we're, we've always been moving forward. Um, and hope that answers your question. 
Um, the project is the result of a competitive process. We did go through an RFQ early on, uh, followed by an RFP that was awarded to the top uh, candidates uh, for the project. Um, key elements with respect to the lease, uh, Aeroterm will be required to construct, as I mentioned, a million feet, uh, square feet of cargo facilities. The project will be built in phases. The term of the lease is 40 years. Um, and actually, the lease uh, really, although we say it's 40 years, it really is not really exactly 40 years because... Which, according to the charter, of course, we have to make findings of anything correct. longer than 30. So what's the case for 40? Correct. Um, we took seven years to get through this. <laughs> <laughs> we believe that the, uh, that the investment uh, required by, uh, by Aeroterm here uh, warrants a 40-year term in order for them to amortize the investment. Uh, but more importantly, I think that uh, um, there is a substantial level of risk associated with the project. The project, to some extent, is market-driven. Remember that I mentioned a moment ago that uh, there is only uh, about half a million uh, annual tons of cargo that currently go through Ontario. Uh, we believe that Ontario can handle around 3 million uh, annual tons. Uh, Aeroterm is really uh, taking a, a fairly substantial risk here. Um, although the lease, as I mentioned, is 40 years and the, and the, 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 the land that they will have control of uh, can uh, total up to 94 acres. Initially, when they, first take, when they first execute the lease, they really will only have control of the first parcel, the first of five parcels, which totals about 18 uh, acres as opposed to the 94 acres. Uh, they've already made a huge investment in the project. Um, and so, as I mentioned, I think... Uh, so what's the, what's the, what's the uh, easy answer on how do we attract more cargo to Ontario? Uh, a lot of it is marketing. I think the cargo carriers uh, recognize that, uh, that the region is already um, uh, approaching its, uh, its maximum uh, uh, capacity. And uh, as we've talked to the cargo carriers at LAX, for example, in trying to attract them uh, to uh, commence or shift their operations to, uh, to Ontario, they all admit that, that they, they understand that the time will come when they, they will have to do something in Ontario because we're out of room uh, at LAX. Do we know how many flights are purely cargo going into LAX versus a mix of passenger cargo? Uh, we do, but I'm sorry I don't have that Is information. Is it 40% or thereabouts? Do you have any idea? You're nodding your head in the I back. I would doubt that. I don't think it's that much. There's 1,800 takeoffs, right? No, oh, just curious. Do we have it, those stats? Can we get them? Well, yeah. It would be interesting to me we, to we, know how many are purely here. cargo flights, because they always tell us that's one of the issues with with getting you know more cargo to to these other airports. Is some of them, most of them, are a mix of passengers and cargo. Right. There is a, a trend, though, and I'm glad you, you brought that up, because there is a trend uh, in the industry to move more toward uh, pure freighter or cargo operations. But we can get that information. I'd like to know that. I think that's interesting as we begin to try to push more air traffic regionally. That's a, that's a key statistic. That's how, how much, what are we working with that's purely cargo right. coming in LAX? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if I can move on here for a second. Um, Aeroterm proposes to invest approximately $156 million in the improvements in the project. Um, as I mentioned, it will be built in, uh, in five phases. Now, the, the, the really nice thing about this for the city and for the Lawa side of the deal is that Aeroterm cannot move to take down subsequent parcels beyond the first parcel until they've met certain milestones. Specifically, they need to construct, in the case of parcel number one, to be able to move to the next parcel. 150,000 square feet of cargo facilities before they can move to the next parcel. And they need to do that for each of the parcels that they take down, and they need to do it by a certain date. If they don't do that, then what happens is they start to lose the option on the easterly most parcels that have not yet been taken down. And that really protects the city to a great extent. Um, so even though the project ultimately can consist of 94 acres, it, it really may end up being less than that, but we uh, have great confidence in Aeroterm uh, that they will be able to take down each of the parcels and, uh, and complete the project as, uh, as expected. With respect to the payments to LAWA, upon lease execution, uh, Aeroterm will pay LAWA $1.5 million, um, uh, a, a balloon payment of $1.5 million uh, in exchange for there are three existing leases on the property that we will be assigning to, um, 
to, to Aeroterm upon commencement of, uh, of the lease. In addition to that, Aeroterm will pay the standard um, uh, uh, ground rent based on appraised value that we do periodically. And in addition to that, Aeroterm will share in, um, in gross revenues uh, on a percentage basis, on a scale basis uh, for, uh, for the project, for the life of the project. Now, we have some benchmarks in terms of what they need to do, but as you said, they're, they're undertaking a considerable risk uh, in terms of the amount of cargo that we think we can divert to Ontario. Do they have any um, benchmarks for, <coughs> for LAWA or our side to uh, ensure that we're, we're working to divert cargo? Uh, I think the I think the question that's a that's a good question uh, because it has been asked before uh, is uh, is is the project is zero term success contingent upon Lawa doing anything? Right. The answer to that question is really no. Uh, uh, although we we do have an understanding and Lawa is committed to the project to work cooperatively. This is not addressed in the lease, but to work cooperatively with Aeroterm in marketing the project. And we have been doing that already, and we, we, continue to, we will continue to do that uh, for, the, uh, for the duration of the project, at least in, uh, as the project is, uh, moves forward and is built. And I'm sure this structure will be used with the best available green technology? Yes. Uh, Aeroterm has agreed to comply with all LAWA policies, uh, current and future, with respect to green, uh, uh, green requirements. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, with respect to the payments is Ontario being a residual airport, all the money that is paid by Aeroterm for the project, the 1.5 million, the ground rent, the percentage rents, will go to help reduce the operating costs of the airport, will, which will help the airlines uh, in the long run. Since it's in Ontario did, during the EIR process, did we have uh, any concerns from the City of Ontario in terms uh, of any mitigation for this? Is, uh, is very supportive of the project. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot of coordination uh, between uh, uh, LAWA staff and the uh, Aeroterm folks and the consultants and uh, with, the, uh, with the City of Ontario staff. They're very, very supportive of it. Uh, there, are, there were some, as I mentioned, as you, know, as you know, there was a full EIR completed. Uh, there were some... Uh, surrounding communities, were they... No, no, we went through the entire process. They don't have neighborhood councils on Ontario. The, the community, believe it or not, uh, unlike LAX, is very, very supportive of the airport. Wait a minute now. Uh, the community loves LAX. We just don't want it expanded. I, I stand corrected. We just want it safe. That's all I want. I stand That's right. Um, um, okay. Do you, I know you probably have some questions. I sure do. Okay, go ahead. Well, Ms. Hall, I'm going to go prepare for council since Fine. I was here on time under budget as the... Uh, <laughs> announcement came in there but I love you both is that okay yeah we're gonna slap you Tom oh, no, strike that from the record strike that from the record I don't know. How, how, how many minutes does it take you from your front door to City Hall uh, seven yeah. <laughs> thank you that's if everything's green uh, for, for, first I, I just want to say thank you thank you thank you thank you great 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 okay uh, and I want to thank the Airport Commission uh, I want to thank the leadership of everybody involved that brings you before us today this is the beginning of true regionalism. None of this cosmetic stuff. It's real. So I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, I would like to let, ask um, Aeroterm to come on up, and I'd like to ask them a couple of questions. Okay. I'm Steve Four. I'm with Aeroterm. Yes. Thank you. Steve, good morning. Good morning. Uh, quickly, give us, give us a, a vision of where you want to take this, how many planes, how, how much cargo, what time frame, and that kind of stuff. We envision over the next 5 to 12 years the full development of the site, ranging between 750 and a million square feet. There will be some variability in all likelihood on the total covered space, and we believe with that development plan by 2020, we can get Ontario to about its maximum cargo tonnages, which would be about 3 million annual tons. I would suspect a million of that will go to others, notably UPS, a couple million on our site. Um, the um, mix of tenants, we believe, will be integrators. Notab the, the last big one that needs space in the Inland Empire is FedEx. We envision and are hopeful that we can have FedEx as a major tenant in our facility, if not the anchor tenant at the facility. DHL, who you may know, has a huge hub that we competed for in cooperation with LAWA a few years ago out at March. 
I think is finding that that was not their best locational choice. They're actually talking to us, albeit about a much smaller facility, not a hub. But nevertheless, we have great confidence that at the end of the development period, this will be a safe, functional, efficient 100-acre cargo project. It's unusual in the United States and in Canada, which is basically where we execute our business plan to have 100 contiguous acres. So this is a great opportunity for LAWA and the city of LA not only to advance the regionalization effort, but to have a true prototypical cargo project that is designed with security, safety. The city of Ontario, as Ramon said, has been very supportive, but they're very, as you can appreciate, concerned about truck traffic through residential areas and more notably at this project through their convention area. The site lends itself to draining trucks to the south away from the convention center, away from a number of residential areas or possibly to the east to connect to the town. So it, it really fits very well in terms of being a vibrant, active, fairly high volume cargo project over the longer term with not a lot of impact on the community, hopefully a huge impact on LAWA's bottom line in terms of absolute financial benefits they get from the project and we hope attracting additional cargo carriers into the system. Well, let me just say, what, what would you be looking for from LAWA in terms of this idea of I, I, marketing? Could I address your... Still your, my question, but go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. I, I was I, I, I'm, I'm um, hey. itching to hey. respond in a little bit more detail to that. Um, Aeroterm is an a entrepreneurial risk-taking firm. We're very comfortable with the risks we've taken here, but it's important for me to share with you on that topic that our comfort lies largely in recognizing it's in the organizational interests of LAWA and the city of LA to support the project in terms of non-economic matters, notably regionalization, making sure not everyone in LA endures the full brunt of growth, particularly when the citizens of Ontario are interested in it, and also because it is in, we believe, LAWA and the city of LA's economic interests to see our project succeed. So we look for cooperation in terms of marketing, promotion, kind of the easy things. We will be looking for assistance with regard to airport operational standards, not just in Ontario, but system-wide in terms of security, particularly cargo security. I, after 9-11, was at the front for our firm with the TSA and with others talking about things that needed to be done to secure cargo in a greater mm -hmm. manner. And candidly, the advancements from the federal level haven't been as quickly as we would have guessed at that point. And I think this project is a great opportunity to, to the extent it makes sense for LAWA and Aeroterm to advance that. Through the gate operations is a good example of that. Uh, there are other things that I won't get into specifics on that could make a huge difference in security, not create a huge amount of impediments to the flow of cargo and the tenant base obviously speed is very important to them so uh, i'm not suggesting inspecting every truck or anything as potentially draconian as that but there are a number of things we can do with lawa that will make it more secure and candidly create demand for the project i love that um, uh, taking the both uh, dhl and fedex what can we do as a city to support you in getting them as tenants? I will be able to answer very, very specifically late next week. We're spending the day, and this is somewhat coincidental because we had to get calendars lined up, but um, John Camet, who I believe um, some of you have met, the president of Aeroterm and I are in Memphis next week all day with FedEx. Um, they want to be in Ontario. We've been talking to them for six or seven years now about this site. We've done two to three huge build to suits for them throughout the United States. I'm very confident there's a deal to be made. I'm equally confident that next week we're going to talk about money. And at some point, I suspect we'll be back talking about this as, as far as we can push FedEx, and we're going to be asking for some assistance, I would think, to land them. Um, again, that's a couple weeks. <laughs> we'd be very happy to, to support you. Uh, we'd be very happy um, uh, to, to do whatever we can do within our roles and, and, and in I appreciate our power that. to support you in getting them as anchor tenants. And, it, and as Ramon said, there is no subsidy, there is no support within the ground lease that is due to us, but as a practical matter, we're willing to take those risks because at the end of the day, we think it's going to be the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. LAWA, the city of L.A., the city of Ontario, not to leave them out, and Aeroterm are going to have to team up and say, 
this is what we need to do. To do to and let's assume, I just want to have this dream sheet and move it further. Sure. Let's assume we can, you can get FedEx and, and DHL in. How many planes do you think that means come in there? FedEx and DHL, um, on now, much like Ramon, we've, I, my mind is a mix of trucks, cars, aircraft. Sure. But we're talking, I think the total operations for the project were six or 7,000 per year. And I can't do the math real quickly in my head, but it was a mix of fairly small aircraft. The Inland Empire is served by turboprops. If you ever go out and watch the way FedEx currently operates, yeah in a facility that they'll admit is antiquated and not efficient for them at Ontario. A bunch of turboprops fly in late each afternoon, they load them into larger aircraft and they're off to Memphis or wherever. Mm -hmm. So it, it'll be a mix, I think, of five to 600 turboprops, three or 4,000 medium-sized jet cargo aircraft, and the balance 747, 767s. The project is designed to accommodate A380s. We don't envision, based on our discussions with FedEx or others, that we'll see any A380s there. Okay, the next part is the infrastructure on the ground. I don't like trucks, okay? Right. I like light rail. I, right. I like uh, clean light rail okay. and all of that. I'll take trucks if they're, sure. if they're, if they're absolutely clean trucks. Um, the infrastructure around the airport, we have a couple of metro links almost yep. attached to it. We have dreams of other things. Have you looked at the ground around the airport to see what would be the best transportation modems that need to go there and what can we do in a regional sense uh, with transportation infrastructure? We have looked and I don't have a specific response as it relates to cargo. In going through the analysis and talking to our tenant base, particularly FedEx, even though optimally we'll have a couple million tons of cargo coming through this project, there's a fair chance a million of it will be plane-to-plane -plane transfer, which is great for LAWA, it's great for our tenants, it's mm -hmm. great for the city of Ontario, because it doesn't create any truck traffic. Mm -hmm. The balance will be, in all likelihood, fairly small trucks. I was candidly surprised when we really got into the detail with the target tenant base. There will be some, knock on wood, transfers on flatbeds and semis from LAX to Ontario, what is known as a split operation, but the predominance of the truck traffic in the city of Ontario will be the delivery vans that you see, the FedEx mm -hmm. 20 to 40 foot, mm -hmm. nothing too egregious in terms of impact on the roads. Mm -hmm. So the rail connection, whether heavy rail, or light rail for employees, as it turns out, is not that big of a consideration for the success of this project. Mm -hmm. I am aware of the maglev and some of the other initiatives yep. that relate largely to passenger that at some point could support cargo ops, but our conclusion on that is that it, it's not a key piece of the success of this project. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you look at it further down the road and if we see things moving in a different direction, we want to know because the business community is very excited about right. working in partnership with governments I to get that transportation infrastructure I understand. in place. Uh, two more questions real mm -hmm. quick. Yeah, the, greening, it's 10 the greening of, of the structures and right. all that, you're going to be as green as you can conceivably be, right? Yes, as Ramon said, the standards that LAWA plans are in somewhat of an evolutionary state. The industry, AeroTerm, as well as our tenant base, is responding to the pressures as well as the logical need to be a little bit more careful with what we do to the air quality, notably in the region. Mm -hmm. And particularly, one of the questions that was asked earlier in terms of ramp up with pollution during the construction phases, even with the phase two clean vehicles that we will require during the construction phases on this project, there's demo, grading, et cetera, there's a little ramp up in terms of air quality. Um, that comes back down, surprisingly enough, once the aircraft operations start. Planes have gotten, just through the seven years we've been working on this, much quieter and much cleaner. So, Great. Well, in conclusion, God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. We don't want to take seven more years in this business. No, we're we want to go yesterday with it. Whatever we can do as a city and a region to support you, we want to support you. And that. when you get a chance, take a deep breath, take a look at Palmdale as a future regional strategy. Because like Denver, uh, some great mayor historically said, let's take Palmdale right. and make it what it should be, uh, which no one has done with, uh, and we would love to get some energy from you on We would on that love to contribute show. to that. Great. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. We have a, a public comment. Uh, oh, no, that's just public comment. So let's uh, move. So move. Okay. Thank you both very much and your staff as well. You thank you. We look thank forward to working care. with you. Okay, Arnold, come on down for a public comment. Oh, I know, I know, I know.
Yeah. Really quick. Yeah, okay. really quick. Um, thank you for calling for an update on your um, project at the Port of Long Beach, because I was wrote it right down here before you even said that. Because oh, okay. I'd be interested to compare the, the um, projects, uh, how, how, how far along it's moving versus, and I know you're going to call for, I know you called for an update on the project at San Pedro for the people, for the, because you have an industrial project versus a public project. Right. And it would be interesting to find out how each one's moving along based on the m amount of money being spent. Right. I'm uh, I went to the airport committee meeting on Monday. They spent $22 million on projects. They only took in $230,000 in revenue. That's nice. Um, they also, I also mentioned that they violated the Brown Act again because they failed to post um, cancellation of last Monday's meeting. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned to them that they're looking at waterboarding and or Gitmo. They didn't what? know what waterboarding was. Good, I'm glad they did. Um, and then I wanted to point out um, uh, one other thing, or two other things actually, about the report from NASA. It seemed to me that two reports were issued. One, uh, the original, when the a report was supposed to come out prior to its issuance, there was uh, an article in the newspaper that stated that it had some information, but a lot of it was generic. And then when the actual report came out, it stated that most of the information was rote numbers and no, nothing could be really gained from it. So, I mean, there were two different articles in the, in the Daily Breeze, one prior to it coming, actual coming out and one the day that it came out. And my basic concern is that NASA was quoted or written in the article that they, they didn't want to um, have the public lose any confidence in the airlines. Well, when you make up a, a cover report like that, you're losing confidence in the airlines. Thank you. Point, Arnie. Enjoyed, again, your keen observation of all of our commissions and being the watchdog out there, keeping us all accountable and our feet to the fire to move our projects forward. And with that, uh, let's adjourn. Submit. <laughs>